Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope that you are doing well um, and staying safe and staying dry, uh, especially this week with all the rain we're having. Um, and thank you for your patience with uh, getting this program switched one to another month and two to another platform. So we really appreciate that. And we appreciate all of you being here. Um, I'd like to start off by introducing our sponsor for today. Our today's sponsor is Lewis Gale Hospital in Montgomery. So I'm going to turn it over to Alan Fabian, the CEO of the hospital, to say a few words. Good afternoon. Thank you, Josie, very much. Uh, I'm proud to be the sponsor today for uh, our legislative session of Eggs and Issues. I wanted to talk a little bit about our organization and where we are today. Uh, there was a great article, I'm not sure everybody saw it, but there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about Blacksburg. Uh, it was uh, the 17th, so a couple days ago. I talked a little bit about college towns and uh, the cancellation of graduations and classes and what, what damage that's done economically. Uh, and certainly, I think everybody in, in the small business arena is now currently looking at what's going on uh, with their volume of customers uh, and how has it, their customer been affected. We are doing the same thing. We are looking at how is the customer relationship with the hospital going to change because of this virus. Uh, so I think it's something that's very important to everybody. Uh, as Dr. Scott will tell you, uh, long-term outlook is for new behaviors. Consumers across the country will remain hesitant to return to things such as international travel, public gatherings, trips to the mall. All of this is going to change. So every business has to look at uh, how, how are they going to change. Uh, I can tell you from our perspective at the hospital, we've taken a focused approach on the patient journey. We've gone back and we've looked at what's it going to take to provide a level of confidence. Uh, and, and we've gone through our community, our employees, and our providers, and all of the different uh, elements of that to create a patient journey that really protects them as they come to the hospital for services. Uh, it is time to get back to providing care to the uh, medically compromised patients, many of who have stayed at home during this crisis. Uh, so we are uh, open for elective patients. We've opened it slowly, uh, but we are open and we will continue to provide services uh, for the patients who need those, especially the ones that have deferred care. Uh, and, and that's a lot of patients we're finding out now. Um, so we're open for business and we want to provide any information they can certainly let me know any questions they have uh, and we can provide that to patients or consumers. I, I wanna now introduce our speaker or our moderator today uh, who will assist us. Uh, that's James Creekmore. Uh, in 2006, after more than a decade of private practice with prominent Virginia firms, James Creekmore opened the Creekmore Law Firm in Southwest Virginia. The firm's practice is a balance between business litigation business counseling, uh, with particular attention given to the protections and enforcement of its clients' intellectual property rights. Uh, patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets, and business agreements, such as non-competition, uh, non-disclosures, non-solicitation, and license agreement, as well as other business competition issues are frequently what the firm is engaged for. James and his team spent a lot of time with entrepreneurs and engaging uh, in growing companies, helping them understand and navigate the laws that pertain to virtually every aspect of their operation. Uh, after obtaining his undergrad at University of Virginia, James received his law degree from College of William and Mary. I'll turn it over to you, James. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, members of the Chamber of Commerce and our delegates. I see Delegate Rush and Delegate Hurst have joined us. Thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. Delegate McNamara, I don't see on yet, but will be joining us shortly. Uh, I also re want to recognize I saw John Bush with uh, Blacksburg Town Council had joined us. So thank you, John, for taking time to be with us and other community leaders. We wanted to take a few minutes today and, and explore with our delegates um, a sort of a recap of just some of the, the items that they believe were important gains for our business community from our past legislative session. Uh, importantly, what they are up to right now in the middle of this pandemic as the business community of Montgomery County and uh, the New River Valley 
to which they serve is, is trying to rebound and recover from this situation. A lot of our community leaders and organizational leaders have spent a tremendous amount of time over the last weeks trying to reinvigorate and re-engage our business community, which also depends upon a reinvigoration of our local residential population to support them. Uh, this has been a, a situation that nobody imagined where one of our largest economic actors, Virginia Tech, that both fuels the workforce and the customer base for most of our businesses um, disappeared largely quickly overnight. And so that was a very difficult situation for us and what prompted the article that Alan just mentioned in the Wall Street Journal. It is a unique problem to college towns and I think uh, Montgomery County and Blacksburg in particular have been relatively hard hit. And so what we would like to talk with our delegates today, uh, as we look forward, both immediately in the summer and as we approach the legislative session this coming fall, and then in the fall, what specific measures we have to look forward to that will help the business community get back on its feet. Uh, Delegate Rush is with us from the uh, 7th District, and Delegate Rush is from Montgomery County, uh, Floyd, and part of Pulaski. Delegate Hurst is Montgomery County, Craig, and uh, part of Pulaski as well. Uh, with a heavy focus on Blacksburg in particular. We've got several members who have submitted questions that they would like to address. And in, in the interest of time, and several of them have other commitments, I would like to recognize a couple of them first to, to put a question out to the delegates and let the delegates have an opportunity to respond to those questions specifically. And if any of you have other questions, any other uh, items of interest that you would like to explore with our delegates, please feel free to put them in a chat or send an email to the chamber and we'll do our very best to have them addressed. But first I'd like to recognize Christy Snyder. Christy Snyder is an administrator with Rainbow Riders Child Care Center in Blacksburg. And Christy has been heavily focused on, on child care issues and early childhood development for educational purposes. And she's got a question that she would like to address. And Delegate Hurst, since you've got a little bit more direct connection with downtown Blacksburg and some of the areas, I'd like to, to turn it to you first after Christy poses her question for your thoughts and responses. And then if, if Delegate Rush has follow-up, we'll turn it to him. Christy? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, first, I want to thank Delegates uh, Rush and Hurst very much for their support of House Bill 1012. Um, we are excited that early childhood education is going to be moving from the Department of Social Services over to the Department of Education. This is a real um, fundamental change to our thinking in the state of Virginia, and I think it's about time. And I remember speaking to each of you about this partic particular bill and its importance and the statement it makes that early childhood education is just not about health and safety, it's about education. And so I really appreciate um, your support in making sure that legislation is moving ahead. Um, we understand that it is still chugging along, um, though it will certainly be hum uh, hobbled a little bit by the, um, fun the funding uh, issues that, that will uh, be unfolding with the COVID crisis. But as you may know, at the end of April, about two thirds of childcare programs across the state have closed due to the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, and this is also in line with national data, not just a Virginia problem. That's over 2,600 childcare programs that serve about 210,000 children statewide. In the New River Valley, we still have 12 centers that remain open. Um, and we are struggling. I mean, we have extremely low uh, in, uh, enrollment, and of course, families are really challenged and worried. And it's uh, you know it's been a, a big crisis. And as you know, early childhood programs operate on a razor thin margin. So um, it is estimated nationwide that roughly half of the child care centers across the country are going to be able to come out the other end of this and survive. Um, our industry is in crisis. We hear on the news about restaurants and all of those, but I, I want to um, really emphasize how important early childhood education is. Um, we are caring for those, for the workforce of Virginia and of the New River Valley. And so as we move forward into the, the post 
post-pandemic uh, recovery phases. I am asking um, our delegates, what can you do to ensure that child care centers in the New River Valley and across the state will have the resources necessary to get through this crisis um, to support our working families? Delegate Hurst, if you've got an opportunity to share some thoughts on that. Sure, uh, it's good to be with all of you and, and Christy, good to see you again and, and talk to you. Uh, I think that you know, we need to make sure that we're very strategic in coordinating resources at the state and federal level. Uh, if you look at the CARES Act allocations to Virginia, uh, child care development block grant, $70 million coming into Virginia for Head Start, it's $12 million coming into Virginia. We need to make sure that those uh, resources are actually put exactly where they need to be. Um, I, I wonder about eligibility for the PPP loans uh, that have been coming from the federal government and whether that has been able to at least keep workforces uh, solvent at this point. Uh, Chris, if you have any information on that, I'd, I'd love to hear it. But, um, you know, I think a lot of it is telling us uh, exactly what you need. Uh, and if the confidence, though, of the consumer is not there, uh, that is going to be a real challenge, and, and Nick and I were on the Appropriations Committee meeting yesterday, and, and Secretary of Finance Aubrey Lane was talking about consumer confidence, being willing to go and participate out in public, and child care is certainly one of those things where you have lots of people, lots of uh, children in one particular area, and uh, how can we try and move forward in a position where the public health crisis isn't so bad, uh, to where we're actually then able to, to challenge the the economic uh, difficulties too. So uh, I think what I have tried to do, at least for our region, you know, when we have about four and a half percent uh, percent positivity rate for the New River Valley, and Delegate Rush has been working very hard on trying to have uh, more testing capabilities for uh, for this region that he might want to talk about later. But uh, we need to understand that our region uh, is doing a lot better than others, and that might mean that our economy might be in a different situation than other regions of the, of the Commonwealth and of the country, and we need to uh, act accordingly. And that means, in some regard, of being willing to go and venture out into our communities again when we believe that it is safe to do so. Uh, trying to convince the public to do that, though, I think is going to be a community effort um, in order to make sure that we can start to get these gears turning again. Yeah, and um, hey, uh, James, yeah, I'd, I'd echo what uh, Delegate Hurst said. And, um, you know, the, the, the CARES Act, the federal government has done uh, stimulus programs. Uh, I think they're at, at three now, maybe four. Um, I hope our, our child care providers have uh, applied for the PPP loans. You know, my office with uh, Dr. Judy Lynch and myself and, you know, in coordination with uh, the other members of uh, Montgomery County's General Assembly delegation. have been working hard to get that information out, also trying to connect folks with um, uh, the appropriate resources, whether it be VEC, local bankers that are willing to do these loans. Um, and uh, then also, uh, and, and Chris uh, got to go first, which I'm glad, because he, 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 really, he really hit it on. It's about confidence. And it's about people, uh, you know, opening up the economy safely, which, uh, which uh, I feel like we can do here in this region as we have robust. Uh, uh, the New River Valley Health Department has done a wonderful job on, uh, on testing. Our local governments got uh, together early, put resources into it, have tested at a higher rate than, than, than most of the rest of the state. Um, we have a COVID-19 task force that meets regularly, maybe daily. Um, Dr. Bissell has been um, really aggressively out there uh, making sure that our citizens are, um, are tested and have good information. And now it's up to all of us, the Chamber of Commerce, us and our individual businesses, um, to get, let parents have, have, know that it's safe to, to, to have uh, their children go to daycare. Christy, it's up to you and your industry to make sure that we're doing the, safe, you know, the, safe, uh, the, the safety protocols for your workforce you know, uh, education for your workforce, uh, whether they have symptoms or uh, they've been around people, not just come back, be able to come to work um, so, it, so it doesn't spread. Um, you know, Alan mentioned it, uh, are, are, are folks changing the way they go to uh, 
to the hospitals or, or how, how they're administered health care. Um, you know, before all this, I think you and I would have, if we were sitting here, other than Alan and some of the folks on here in the medical community, would have thought um, uh, uh, health care was, um, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for there? Where you, you, the, the, the procedures that aren't required. Uh, right. Say again? Electives? Yeah, elective, man. Yeah, sorry. Now my face is turning red because I'm embarrassed that I couldn't remember the elective. <laughs> uh, I hope I'm on black and white, man. Um, but uh, elective surgeries, we would have thought, oh, uh, facelift, some of these things. But you know, now that we've all learned, elective surgeries also mastectomies, uh, heart uh, heart procedures, uh, chemotherapy, some of these things that folks have been putting off uh, during this. And so we've got to get uh, healthcare back to uh, people that are sick and need it. And so, uh, you know, Christy, we, with, with the right mitigation process, um, the right safety standards in your industry, people should feel comfortable uh, sending their children uh, back to daycare. And that's, that means we've got to get the, uh, uh, the parents going back to work. And uh, that, you know, I mean, we are Chris and I and Joe and the senators are, are, are constantly talking with uh, our universities and our employers. Uh, making sure they have the resources they need to uh, to get things um, get things rolling again. As a segue from both of your comments, uh, what are each of you specifically doing each week as we go through this this recovery period? Certainly, this summer is going to look a lot different for each of you than than previous summers in terms of demands on your time and workloads and uh, impacts on your constituents, how, how have each of your day-to-day -day operations changed as a result of what our business community is facing? Delegate Rush? Yeah, well, you know, personally, I'm in, um, I'm in financial services. I do, I do uh, life insurance, so, and then um, perfect timing on my part, me and a couple of buddies bought a restaurant in Blacksburg uh, about 18 months ago. So not only have I, you know, have I, am I helping to, you know, to try to get my constituents uh, the resources they need, but it's also affected me uh, personally and, and financially. So a lot of my time is is one trying to keep my businesses afloat and, and my family moving forward. Luckily, my wife is uh, working from home and and she's been able to maintain her uh, her job. But then on a day to day basis, on a weekly basis, our biggest uh, our biggest thing has been with the VEC and uh, Chris and I and, and Joe. Uh, We've we've interacted more with the VEC in the last seven weeks than I have in nine years, and it's uh, uh, it's we've had you know hundreds of thousands of people, tens of thousands in the New River Valley access the VEC, the Virginia Unemployment Commission or Employment Commission, uh, for unemployment benefits um, for the first time, and and these folks are and, and the system's been inundated. They haven't, uh, the VEC's uh, computer system hasn't been able to keep up with it. And uh, it's, it's, um, they also, the, the federal, the, the first stimulus had the uh, PUA, which, which gave the 600 additional dollars per week, which was a later on, uh, the, the, the VEC's uh, computer system wasn't able to process that. So they're getting those payments out later. And so it's mostly been trying to help folks access their state government to make sure that they're getting the resources they need. We've also been uh, involved, I've gone to the COVID-19 um, uh, task force meeting, visited testing centers, I know Chris has too, um, and, and we, we've interacted with uh, the state government trying to uh, help our, um, our uh, long-term care facilities, had trouble getting some PPEs, a couple, of, uh, a couple in my district has. We accessed, you know, we tried to connect them with the right folks at the health department or uh, at the state level to make sure that those, uh, they, and those are the most vulnerable sites, um, uh, uh, to make sure they had the proper PPE. And we, we, we were lucky, and I'm going to knock on wood, uh, um, that uh, we, we had some folks that go went into facilities that, um, that had COVID-19, and uh, but uh, our, our long-term care facilities actually isolated them and we're able to keep them from uh, spreading uh, spreading the virus. So it's been a challenge for 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 Dr. Judy Lynch and myself, um, uh, but uh, nothing like um, 
what my constituents gone through. You know, a lot of people be like, oh man, I bet it's, you know, it's this or that. Well, you know, I always used to say, well, you know, being a delegate is not mining coal. That's hard work. I get to wear a suit and go into a, a nice office building for a couple months a year and, and meet with uh, great people of the seventh district in the new river Valley in Virginia. That's not that hard. This has put an extra additional challenge on, but um, you know, like so many of you, I've done hard things in my life and, you know, I just keep, uh, keep my nose to the grindstone and just keep trying to chug out results for, for my constituents. Yeah, and uh, as Delegate Rush said, we are doing so much uh, with the DEC right now. My chief of staff, Sadie Gary, is is working with me to process a lot of people who have come out for requests. And quite frankly, it's been frustrating for a lot of people because the reality is is the DEC has about half of the staff that it had at the time of the Great Recession in, in 2009. And uh, we have now more people who are filing for unemployment in one month than we normally have in a full calendar year. Uh, and so people have been slammed and uh, we have uh, been expanding capacity at call centers, including one in Grundy, Virginia, uh, to try and make sure that more people can uh, get their state, process, uh, their state claims uh, properly processed. Um, one of the things that my office has been involved in for the last few years is on not only uh, child care, but also uh, child abuse and child neglect prevention. Uh, we were able to get an Office of Children's Ombudsman uh, created this past legislative session to be able to investigate uh, issues arising from our Department of Social Services and uh, Child Protective Services complaints. And uh, now that office, uh, thankfully, has been funded and uh, we are in the process of trying to start it up. And what we do know is that when we have people who are unemployed, uh, newly unemployed, when we have people who are now uh, sometimes forced to be in their homes that uh, issues of domestic violence, uh, addiction, uh, alcoholism, uh, child abuse, child neglect, uh, depression, suicidality, those are all things that are on the rise, not to uh, diminish the urgent, urgent crisis of a fatal pandemic, uh, but that these are other things that government uh, tries to play a hand in solving. Uh, and, and that work still continues, uh, but we have huge workforce challenges, uh, huge morale challenges, uh, and also now trying to get access uh, to these families uh, for monitoring uh, is difficult. So uh, we are continuing to just plug holes where we can and try and be as useful as possible. Um, a lot of times we're just doing uh, these, we're doing Zoom calls, uh, just trying to get updated and get briefed and uh, asking all the time, what can we do? What do you need us to, to know? What uh, can we advocate for you on? Uh, and thankfully, as Delegate Rush said, the NRV is in a better situation than most regions. Uh, and so the asks haven't been monumental, uh, but we are ready uh, for when they come and certainly want to know uh, what they are whenever they come up. From that, we know that there's going to be more federal funding released to the states uh, specifically Delegate Hearst, what are, what are the opportunities to channel some of that funding into our area that is going to suffer as we continue to move forward with lack of taxes on meals and lodging, and especially depending upon what happens with this coming fall's football season, there could be a major impact on the tourism aspects of our business industry in Blacksburg and Montgomery County. What's the opportunity for federal funding to support those businesses? Well, not speaking as someone who can go up to Washington, D.C. and get a check for anybody as a state legislator. But um, I think that what I have seen and in consultation with um, our Senate offices is certainly a desire to want to get uh, colleges and universities and those college towns and college cities uh, addressed specifically in a new round of funding uh, if that can be approved. Uh, I think that there is a unique uh, challenge that our college towns face, uh, and Blacksburg certainly is no exception. Bradford, that I also represent, no exception. But when you lose half of a population of people, uh, that is uh, in some ways even more catastrophic than uh, having an outbreak occur you know, in that community, because even in an outbreak, you still are going to have people consuming goods. But when you have half of the entire population just gone, uh, I mean, that's basically like they've all died and gone away uh, immediately. And what is going to happen if they can't come back in the fall, I think is going to be very distressing. And 
uh, it is going to be very challenging. Uh, aside from direct cash infusions, essentially bailing out uh, these um, these small businesses who need help, or providing you know no interest loans like what PPP is, uh, and and also having loan forgiveness be an option for that too. I mean, I think those are all the kinds of things that we need to look at, and then also looking at expanded eligibility, and that's where the rubber is really going to meet the road. So. How do you qualify? How do you determine verification that you have lost all of this revenue or that you uh, might be going under because of direct or indirect COVID uh, related uh, effects? Uh, those are going to be very difficult challenges to parse through uh, as the federal government is trying to determine how much and to whom it's going to allocate any additional uh, funds. Uh, and it's something that you know I'll try and be in the loop for as much as possible uh, but these are things that our congressional delegation and our and our two senators are really going to need to lead the charge on. Yeah, and, and um, obviously, obviously, Chris and I are, are friends, but we're in different political parties. And I've had personal conversations with our Congressman Morgan Griffith addressing uh, these issues. Um, also, I had a call last uh, week with uh, uh, Secretary of Finance Aubrey Lane um, right after the initial round of uh, federal uh, uh, monies were distributed based on population. I specifically brought up the fact that the New River Valley is so uh, dependent on, um, on our universities um, and, and you know, brought up the fact that, as Chris just said, literally the town of Blacksburg and the city of Radford, 50 percent of their population has, has disappeared. Um, and, um, you know, it's the same for Montgomery County, whether it be, you know, probably around 30 percent for Montgomery County and 20 you percent know, for the town of Christiansburg. And so uh, that's a lot of economic activity. So uh, I followed up with a letter last uh, late last week uh, to Secretary Lane to uh, make sure that um, those feelings were in writing and uh, so that that. Uh, the, 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 that the folks in Richmond and in Washington, D.C. realize that we, we are facing um, different challenges. Uh, so unlike Norfolk area where there's still, um, you know, the federal government's uh, spending is, has, uh, um, has, has still been going on, they're still doing construction, construction or, uh, you know, for military uh, ships and stuff, or the federal government where they've, uh, they've sent all their folks home to, uh, to work from home. Um, you know, the, 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 the uh, New River Valley is uh, dependent upon a, uh, uh, our two universities and, and not to shortchange New River, but uh, less so uh, New River Community College just because of uh, who their students are already local. But um, so we, we are, you know, it's a challenge. Um, I've tried to address it. I know Chris has. I, I, we've discussed this when, when, we've, when we spoke on the phone a couple of times. And uh, you know the, this, this, the town of Blacksburg brought this up to me, uh, town of Christiansburg, and uh, the city of Radford has too. And so uh, I think we're, you know, we'll be there to advocate it. Um, Chris and I both serve on appropriations, so when, and 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 uh, we're going to have a special session in August or September, and um, we're going to have to deal with legislation. Hopefully, it'll be a specific legislation. Uh, uh, special session that will only deal with uh, COVID-19 issues. Um, but one of those things will be the budget. So we will have to wait and see what the governor does uh, and some of this allocation. And then Chris, myself, Joe, um, and, and our, uh, John and David will be able allowed to put in budget amendments um, to make sure that our interests are represented. And uh, luckily New River Valley has two folks on that committee. So um, we're, we're at least in the room when, when some of these decisions are being made. Thank you. From that, that response, Delegate Rush, Virginia has just recently recovered its status as a business-friendly state. We struggled for a little while with the perception that we were not necessarily open to businesses. And having just attained that status again, or at least been recognized for it, why would we open up the issue of right to work again in Virginia? Why is that an issue that's being considered presently? And I'm not, I know that this is something that, that you and Delegate Hurst uh, spend a lot of time debating in the in the the house, but uh, specifically from your perspective, um, how does that benefit the business community, and what can we do in the forthcoming general assembly session to help the business community through this? Um, well, that's a that's that's a great question. Um, 
you know, of course, I'm, I, I believe in, in right to work, and uh, I believe it's, it's helped Virginia become one of the most prosperous states in the common, uh, well, not the Commonwealth, but in the, in the country. And, um, you know, that was, that, was, that was proven well before the pandemic, whether it's uh, lowest uh, unemployment in the, in the Southeast, um, best place to do business uh, in the country. So, you know, those are issues that uh, I voted against. Um, you know, I take a holistic approach to, to business. I, you know, sometimes we get it, we, we uh, devolve into these, these issues as though this is workers versus management. And um, as many of you know, I'm, I'm a son of a uh, union pipe fitter, a son of a, a school teacher, um, joined the army right out of high school and then drove a FedEx truck for 12 years. So when I, when I first got elected to the Board of Supervisors in 1991, my, camp, my typical day was uh, drive a FedEx truck for eight to 12 hours a day, and then go knock doors for two to four hours a night, uh, trying to win that election, which I was successful. Also, I've always taken the holistic approach that the business has to be successful for owners and workers. And uh, I felt like that the, uh, that the, the change in the right to work would uh, actually set workers back, set businesses back, set Virginians' um, uh, prosperity back. And I'll tell you this, um, if this pandemic hasn't shown um, that living in a prosperous nation with the ability to manufacture things, the ability to innovate, the, the, the higher education system, which um, trains our nurses, our doctors um, better than anybody in the world. If this, hasn't, if this pandemic, a sudden shutdown, of, of almost all business hasn't shown what America's greatness, and that's the ability to, uh, to uh, turn around products quickly, to innovate quickly. Um, and that's because we're prosperous. And that's because we had a strong economy going into this. Could you imagine if this would have happened in 2008 or nine, we would have sunk into a, into a depression that, that we would probably still be in. And so I think it's very important to, to maintain um, our ability to innovate, prosper, and to expand our, our economy. And look, man, business owners got enough people advocating for them. I don't advocate for business owners for those reasons. I have advocate because I know the workers have to have a place to work. And as a guy who drove a FedEx truck for 12 years from a guy uh, who, who uh, invented the industry, the overnight industry, I'm old enough to remember the FedEx commercials where that dude talked real fast. And that was the invention of the overnight industry. And uh, that was Fred Smith, a very rich guy from Tennessee um, who joined the uh, Marine Corps and flew uh, aircraft in Vietnam when he didn't have to after graduating from Princeton. He put together, I think in 1973 or four, of the biggest venture capital we had ever uh, at the time and created a whole industry. Uh, and, and he employs hundreds of thousands of people. And I was lucky enough to work there when they had a pension, health care, all those things. So I don't do it for Fred Smith. I do it for the next uh, generation of, of guys getting out of the Army and, and that need good jobs. So I'm, I voted against those things. I, thought, I felt like it was important to vote against them. And um, I'm going to continue to vote against them and, and try to get uh, Virginia where, uh, where we can be prosper and maintain our prosperity. Delegate Hurst, I want to throw the same topic to you, but with a different different approach. What what would the benefit be to the New River Valley, specifically and to the constituents that you serve, the business community that's represented here? What is the perceived benefit of repealing the Virginia right to work law, specifically on the New River Valley at large? Well, I, I think it's a little premature to really be talking about this, uh, considering where we are at this step. The right to work legislation didn't make it out of committee in the House, was not introduced in the Senate, uh, and now we're in the middle of a recession uh, where I don't think we have an ability to do some of the things that we otherwise would want to do. So I, I think the question really is moot. Uh, but to answer it directly, um, it's really not for business owners. It's for workers. And that's a good thing. We can do things for workers that also don't harm the business community too. Uh, show me the statistics that show that right to work is a deleterious uh, uh, you know, instrument against the business community writ large. It's not, but it does help workers. And in this time where we have seen that in this transition away from manufacturing to a service economy, that something like a pandemic has completely eliminated the desire for individuals to go out and get services. And so all of these people who are doing service jobs are now left holding the bag. 
where they said, okay, you don't want us to make widgets anymore. We'll go out and we'll paint nails and we'll work in grocery stores and we'll work in retail. And oh wait, now during this pandemic, you're saying you don't want this labor from us now too? Uh, we can't continue to shortchange those people who have a really difficult time advocating for themselves. And I think measures like uh, right to work limit the ability for workers to have more of a station within their own workplace. But that being said, I don't really want to talk about right to work for at least a full calendar year, maybe even two in the Commonwealth of Virginia, because we are not at that point to really open up Pandora's box in that regard. And I feel like there are other more tangible ways that we can help workers in this uh, Commonwealth more uh, than by repealing right to work. So, I mean, look at the legislation. I didn't introduce it. I didn't co-patron it. And I never voted for or against it because I never made it out of committee. So I think, I think the issue is a little overblown. I, I hope people would maybe take a deep breath and not be so concerned about right to work for, for the interim. Thank you for that response. And, and a, a direct follow-up to that, a corollary bill, the increase in the minimum wage has at least been delayed implementation until next year. Is there an opportunity as we look forward to a, probably a slow, but hopefully steady recovery from this pandemic, is there a further opportunity to delay implementation of that? We've heard from a number of business owners locally that they're particularly concerned about the amount of money that they have received already through the PPE, not being adequate to get them through the fall, hoping that there's another opportunity for funding to get them through the fall, especially if football season, which again, is a, a very big issue for our local business community, especially if football season does not occur in the way that it normally has. And they're definitely afraid of an implementation of the increase in the minimum wage uh, early next year. Is there an opportunity to revisit that this fall as a result of this pandemic as well? I think there's an opportunity to revisit it. I, I wouldn't say that that is the right thing for us to do, though. I think that we should have had the minimum wage increase take effect uh, in July. For all of us who are making Facebook posts and tweets and going out cheering for our heroes, and we are now looking at passing a Heroes Act in Congress, these are, again, those same exact service workers that we're going to say don't deserve a pay raise. So they're out there risking their lives, providing services for us, potentially getting exposed, but the person who's there getting your stuff at Kroger doesn't deserve a pay raise. I mean, Kroger increased their hourly rate $2 during this pandemic to try and address the fact that they needed to pay their workers more. And now they're taking it away and now they're giving them a bonus. So wages obviously are stagnant. That's why we're faced with such a, a huge problem, which is that 40% of Americans don't have any money in their savings to last them more than one paycheck. I mean, that's a huge problem. And, and we're not talking about getting the minimum wage to $15 overnight. It's not about a living wage that would be 20 or $25 or more. We're talking 9.50 an hour. 9.50 an hour. And I think the people that we are now praising for being heroes deserve 9.50 an hour more than 7.25. We've seen a number of local retailers and uh, small service providers and small business owners, and in particular, a lot of my clients are coming to me with a common problem, and that is right now, they can't get their workers back to work. The workers are receiving an unemployment compensation that is greater than what they were receiving while they were at work. And even though the businesses are now given the opportunity under certain restrictions to reopen, they are having a very difficult time getting their employees back to work. And so recognizing your, your statement just now about the need to reward financially the workers that are on the front line, isn't there a place for the free enterprise and market system to address this issue because these small business owners are gonna to have to recognize a way in which they pay their employees more to get them back to work. They've gotta get them over the threshold that they're currently making while unemployed to bring them back in. Isn't that something that we could look forward to the market correcting on its own in the meantime? Uh, so I do uh, video commercial workforce assisted a living facilities and right now with their workforces that's a, a huge issue is that the compensation from unemployment through August is going to be more than they would otherwise make and so they're saying I'm not going to expose myself and make less I'm going to sit at home and make more you know we'll see what happens after August um, but I think that it is a, a very real challenge and something that is just a matter of how much has been allocated 
uh, for those who, who are temporarily uh, unemployed. Uh, that, those were all federal decisions for what the allotment would be at the state level. Uh, we increased it a, a little bit, but you know, that's like an extra uh, hundred or two hundred dollars a month, not not something that I think would be a prohibitive uh, for employment. But um, you know, if they're offering, if the federal government is offering wages that that are good, you know, that's kind of a market actor that's coming in uh, that is is gaming the system a little bit. Um, if if things if you can't have a workforce because you can't, uh, they won't they won't meet your salary request, then maybe you got to look at the wages. You know, uh, this part-time issue with unemployment and COVID, I think it's very real and I'm very sensitive to that, but I think it's kind of an outlier and, and kind of a separate conversation than, than a minimum wage increase, you know, uh, a, as a floor for the entire population. So, um, but you know, these are the same questions that, that we talk about every single time when we have these eggs and issues conversations, it's always about, right to work in minimum wage. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I've tried to articulate my positions on both of those uh, issues uh, each time. Uh, and I know that, that Nick and I are gonna have disagreements on it, but uh, that's kind of where we are, I think, in Montgomery County too, where we have uh, a lot of disagreement on this issue. Delegate Rush, you've got both a personal interest and a local restaurant business. And as a small business owner dealing with trying to bring employees back and, and operate under the restrictions that are in place, and also as a legislator and a delegate for the Montgomery County region, what do you see as the opportunities for the state to assist the business owners in getting their businesses back up and running where they're fighting against the benefits that are being provided to the workers outweighing the benefits that small business owners can presently afford to pay? Well, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's a very challenging issue and that's, that's some of the problems with, uh, with uh, legislative bodies getting together during a, during a crisis and, and throwing a, together a, a bill that probably have them haven't read. Um, so, and if you look at some of the, the way the, the benefits were, um, you know, as Chris said, they run through August, the PPP was designed for two months. It was never designed for this, for this long term, uh, as a long term solution. And, you know, now we have, uh, you know, we have, um, in my opinion, and, 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 um, and I know there'll be different, differing opinions on, on this call. In my opinion, you know, we should have been opening up uh, Virginia regionally. Um, we, you know, if you're ahead of the curve on, on testing, if your positive rate is, uh, is four, four, four and a half percent compared to 17 percent for the state, if um, then you should be allowed to have some uh, some some more flexibility and open your businesses. And, and one of the things that um, that business owners are struggling with is if you open up uh, a restaurant at 50 percent of outdoor seating, and you have uh, 45 employees, and you can and you can seat 22 people. There's no the workforce. The demand is not there. So it's it's not that businesses don't want to pay more uh, to their employees. I think businesses, for the most part, uh, work hard to make uh, to make employee. And I know you know I do in my personal uh, life. I just try to make employee morale a positive. Uh, try to compensate as best as the business will allow without government intervention and tell me, tell me what the wage has to be. Um, so it, I, James, honestly, I don't know that Chris and I or Joe, uh, you know, Joe, Joe owns a, a bunch of ice cream uh, parlors. Uh, I don't know if they call them that or maybe it's an ice cream restaurant. I'm not sure, but um, you know, moving forward, you know, as, as legislators and as, as, as folks that work in the private sector do, because Virginia has, uh, has part-time legislators, these are these are real issues that you know I'm not sure what the answer is right now. Just honestly, we're going to have to you know uh, Chris and I were on a call yesterday or a meeting uh, uh, for appropriations. Uh, our revenue has not fallen through the floor yet, so we really don't have great data to know what the budget's going to look like next uh, next uh, year. So we've had uh, our, our our data point for the month month of March was we were still up over projected, um, I mean, Chris can correct me if I'm wrong, over the projections of, of increase. I think we're at five something and, and we were expecting three something. So even in that last two weeks of, uh, of March when, when things started going downhill quick, 
um, we didn't see a, uh, a, a, we actually had a, a positive month for, compared to our projections. And then in April, obviously that, that's fallen off, but um, still not as much as, as some would have expected. So uh, once we get, get a little more data on, on, on revenue for the state, but I'm gonna tell you, I'm not gonna be, you know, I, I'm very sympathetic towards uh, Christy Snyder, who's in the um, private sector trying to provide uh, health care, excuse me, child care, and, and Alan and Carillion and those guys. And, you know, and I, and I, you know, I see Chris Cook on here uh, trying to sell uh, real estate. And um, I never care about lawyers. They, got it. they can advocate for themselves. But um, come on, James, you should have laughed at that. Right? <laughs> but, uh, but so, but, um, you know, these other folks need, uh, are going to need uh, assistance um, from the state government, whether it be regulatory relief. You know, we see some of the things that, that we did in the restaurant industry, whether it be ABC off-premise, allowing mixed uh, drinks off-premise, um, some of those things. And, but there's going to be need regulatory relief, tax relief, um, possible grants. Um, but, but Chris and I are very limited. We, the state of Virginia cannot go into debt. Uh, the state of Virginia does not print money. Um, and so uh, we, that, that, that uh, the debt, the debt um, going into uh, debt is, is the federal government. And if they were to distribute funds, then Chris and I, you know, if they give us some flexibility, we're definitely going to uh, try to advocate for the New River Valley and in, in our industries. Thank you very much for, for that. And I just see Delegate McNamara has joined us. Thank you for making time today, Delegate. Appreciate that. We've got you on mute still. There we are. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm sorry I couldn't get out a few minutes earlier. I uh, uh, had a conflict before this, but thank you. That is all right. Uh, we, we've been talking about a number of different is issues. Uh, just as a, a general introduction to the group, what are some of the things that you are, are spending the majority of your time right now with from a business entity owner perspective? What are you doing or what are you seeing that the business owners are needing in your district to, to get back on their feet? Well, there, there's a couple things. First, uh, you know, we, we need to have businesses need revenue. And uh, so, uh, certainly, I'm in the ice cream business. I know Nick is in uh, the business as well, and and so uh, many of your members were struggling uh, with from a revenue perspective. So uh, you can't cut costs. You can't um, can't run businesses without revenue. Uh, so one thing uh, that I think is very very positive though is the federal government uh, has done a number of, of very very proactive things that have helped business owners. The Paycheck Protection Program is huge. Um, there's another program that uh, I try to, uh, to tout every time I have an opportunity. It's not nearly as well known. It's called the uh, Employee Retention Credit. Uh, that actually was another component of the CARES Act that the Paycheck Protection Program was in. Perhaps many, uh, perhaps all on the call have heard of the Paycheck Protection Program. Probably most have not heard of the Employee Retention Credit. Uh, the employer retention credit is a great opportunity for um, small businesses, particularly restaurants, people that have had significant drops in their revenue structure uh, to uh, have almost have 50% of their payroll uh, in a tax credit. So I did want to just throw that out there every time I have every opportunity. It's a super program and uh, it's something that I'm participating in in a couple of my businesses and uh, I hope others that are not aware of it uh, we'll, uh, we'll hear about it. Uh, the only drawback or, is if someone participates in the Paycheck Protection Program, they cannot participate in both programs. So I did want to throw that out. Um, you know, but uh, business people, uh, we're resilient. Business owners are resilient. They know how to make, make things happen. We know how to deliver a, a product and service uh, safely. And that's what we're trying to do. James, you're on mute. Got you, buddy. Thank you. Uh, one of our members has shared a particular perspective that I think is unique and, and warrants consideration and, and each of your feedback. Uh, the perspective is that if we want to get the businesses and the business community back up and running, 
one of the fastest ways that we can do that is getting the schools reopened and getting the children back in schools and then the business owners have the opportunity to get back into their businesses, the support services that are around the school systems may then be able to flourish. And that includes both primary education and secondary education. But in order to do that, taking away from what we heard, uh, the conversation and exchange with Christy earlier, we need the safety and security of knowing that we can put kids back in school safely, which depends upon more PPE and it depends upon more testing. What state funding opportunities are there and what's the push that we can make to get students back in classes in the fall in a safe way so that both the college campus may be able to reopen in a safe manner, that the younger primary and secondary education facilities can reopen in a safe manner, um, and we can get the businesses that surround them and support them back to work. Uh, Delegate McNamara, since you just joined us, have you got any thoughts particularly about what we can do to channel that direction for the fall? Well, I think you know, we have uh, federal funding at the state level, uh, federal funding directed to the state level that is earmarked co toward COVID funding. I don't know the numbers right off the top of my head. I want to say uh, it's about a half a billion dollars. I could be wrong on that. Uh, and it's a matter of prioritizing where are you going to use, utilize those funds. I think as delegates uh, across the aisle, we're more than willing to work with the governor. We're more than willing to go into a special session. Uh, there was many uh, delegates uh, um, that actually myself being one of them that uh, sent a letter to the governor encouraging uh, that we start taking reprioritizing our budget and evaluating what our most important issues are to to respond to the COVID crisis. Uh, so at this point, we have not done a lot uh, at the state level. I think the state level, there's a hope that there's going to be a very large paycheck coming from the federal government. I don't know the Republicans in the, 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 the House of Representatives are of the same, or excuse me, at the Senate in particular are of the same mindset. Uh, so uh, I think we're, we're gonna have to wait and see. Uh, but we do have, uh, the good news is we have a good, we had a very, very strong, good, vibrant economy. We have, uh, we would have had somewhere in two point, about $2 billion uh, of monies available that uh, we, we could have tapped into that we can and, and are tapping into both from increases to reserves this year as well as increases that existed prior to this year's budget. And I think it's just a matter of prioritizing. But I, I would agree that uh, getting our students back in school and, and most importantly getting them back in school safety is certainly a priority that many of us have and I think it'd be a priority of the, the General Assembly. Also, uh, you know, the, the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the state has released and I mean, Chris or Joe may know the exact number, but I think it's like $360 million that has, uh, has, has gone towards our, our local governments. Now that, that money must be used for uh, COVID related expenses. Um, I believe Montgomery County's was in eight, eight and a half million dollar uh, bucket uh, down in, uh, in the city of Rafford since there's some folks here on the call. I think theirs was like 1.5 million. And, um, and so that money can be used for testing and so what I've been advocating, I've been talking with uh, county administrators through, uh, throughout the New River Valley, Virginia, uh, uh, the, the, the New River Valley Health Department, Dr. Bissell, and uh, some of our healthcare providers is an aggressive uh, uh, testing regimen and also doing a randomized uh, antibody test so that we know how, how, um, how uh, far this, um, this virus has spread out throughout the community since we know so many people are asymptomatic and you know if if you haven't talked to someone or you yourself don't think you've already had it then you are in the uh in the minority because i know everyone is on on this uh, on this zoom call has talked to somebody that said man i was really sick in, in february and uh, man i was really sick in january so i mean i just don't think we know the extent of this asymptomatic spread um since the recovery rate is so uh high in, uh, especially in certain bands, um, uh, in certain band, uh, age group bands uh, with no co comorbidities, um, you could have actually had this and not and, and not know and spread it throughout the community. So what we really got to do is get an idea of what we're doing. And uh, with these uh, federal uh, monies, 
Um, I'm advocating um, uh, a, a approach where we get aggressive on this, um, do some randomized testing so that we know the spread and so we know the, uh, um, where, where we're standing. Because if the numbers are what we hope they would be, you know, we already have a four or four and a half percent uh, positive rate on, on tests of people who are, who are at least suspect, suspect having it. Um, you know, you think that you would think that number would be lower. Um, so we would like to get that number so we can, you know, uh, let our schools know that this, it, that it's safe to reopen. And, and Joe said it, I know Chris feels it, uh, even though we may all three come at things from a, a slightly different angle, none of us advocate doing anything that's not safe. And uh, so what, what, what uh, you know, we may have different views on, on what that number is. And as you see that uh, throughout the Virginia um, uh, House of Delegates or, or, or throughout the nation, but there's no one advocating doing something that's not safe. So uh, my hope is, is that we do get schools opened up. Um, you're, you're looking at uh, Rafford University has said they do plan on opening. Um, Dr. Hemphill has been, um, he, he wants to get students back on uh, campus safely. Um, he's, uh, you know, I know Virginia Tech, I think, has, has requested $9 million for, for testing. Um, so, you know, maybe they're going to do some things, uh, you know, pre, pre coming to the New River Valley. And uh, so we're hoping that, uh, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful and I, and I think the science backs this up. Um, I, I've asked folks uh, about some of these modeling and, and, and it's very hard to get question, uh, questions answered when you ask, uh, ask the scientists about their models, um, but setting that aside. So, uh, but I'm, I'm hopeful and, and I think the science will back it up when, when we get closer to uh, opening up our universities and our K through 12. Uh, education is, is, is gotta be a priority. It is in the general assembly. And um, I know it is for, uh, for our local governments too. So I'm very hopeful for later in the summer. Um, and, and just real quickly, I mean, education is the economic driver of the New River Valley, uh, both secondary uh, and primary. And so we have to understand that, um, you know, while we're all trying to get amateur degrees in epidemiology, from what Noel Bissell, the health district director, has told me is if we're below 10 percent uh, infection, then we have an ability to operate freely in our communities again with uh, precautions in place. But something that you can have confidence in and at four and a half percent in the new river valley we're in good shape we need to hold it we need all of the other communities around us to do their job to get an infection rate below 10 percent we have the capacity to test we have the ppe now in virginia uh, so that's not an issue anymore what we need to do now is we need to lower the infection rate which means doing all of the things that we don't like doing, wearing masks and staying away from each other and staying inside, you know, more often than not. We continue to do those things. That is the only way that we're gonna be able to be in a position to, to reopen schools, uh, both our K-12 uh, and our, our colleges and universities. I think the fight though is probably, excuse me, going to be in the fall, is a Radford or Virginia Tech uniquely situated and capable of reopening while other public colleges and universities in Virginia are not? And can we continue to take a regional approach and how will that affect enrollment? How will that uh, affect with local regional politics uh, at play? And uh, those are all considerations that I have going into the fall, but really the question is moot until we can really get the infection rate under control. We have it here. Uh, we just need to continue to do the work to make sure that it holds through the summer and into the fall. Thank you, Doug. Hey, hey, James, let me add something quickly. Uh, if uh, folks want to go on the Virginia Hospital, the Virginia Hospital Association uh, website, I know we're all familiar with the Virginia Department of Health dashboard. The Hospital Association also has their da a dashboard, and it talks about uh, uh, healthcare systems that are having difficulty with getting PPE, or the amount of uh, ventilators that are 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 in use, or uh, the percentage of beds that are being used. And uh, it's a it's a real eye opener. Um, I, I gave an interview. Uh, uh, probably six weeks ago to the Floyd press. And, and, you know, they, they were like, of course we, it was, it was, you know, we talked about the things going on, uh, 
at that time, you know, short term and then long term. And I, and, and I said that long term, the big problem is going to be is what this done, has done to our healthcare system for the lack of revenue. And uh, something Chris and Joe and I are going to have to look at is, is how we fund through Medicaid um, and, and how the federal government fund, funds through Medicare, um, our rural healthcare systems. I had a bill, I think it was maybe two or three years ago. I think it was two years ago where that we, we uh, funded uh, at a hundred percent rate uh, rural hospitals with under 25 beds. And we may have to look to expand that because uh, we can't have this, um, this uh, obviously a clearly a pandemic, a deadly pandemic as, as uh, Chris said, um, but it can't be, it can't, it can't fast forward so that uh, Tazewell or Giles County's hospitals are, are closing and folks can't get uh, the urgent health care they need 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And so those are, some, um, you know, we need, we need to make sure we keep an eye on, uh, on some of that as we go forward too. Thank you. Delegate Hurst, I got a specific question and follow up to your comments. Recognizing that we have uh, Virginia Tech and others contributing to positive testing capabilities in Montgomery County, and we've done a very good job maintaining uh, low infection rates and, reco and high recovery rates, would you be in favor of advocating for a regional approach to reopening specifically around epicenters like Virginia Tech and other uh, centers that have done a good job maintaining low rates of infection and high testing capabilities? Would you be in favor of trying to get Montgomery County reopened sooner as a result of that? Yeah, I've been uh, vocal about being in favor of regional reopening um, to the detriment of uh, some of the opinions of my uh, fellow Democrats in the House and Senate. Uh, but I think that in rural Virginia and in other parts of Virginia, it's different than in the urban crescent and needs to be uh, addressed accordingly. So uh, I would be in support of, of uh, having all phases of our economy, including education, uh, be reopened on a regional basis if we have assurances that it can be done uh, safely and if we need to that we could uh, be more restrictive in the future if uh, the science requires it. Thank you. Delia McNamara, you serve a slightly uh, more diverse population between parts of Roanoke, City of Salem, and then our lower, I guess, southeast uh, quadrant of Montgomery County. Um, how do you fall on the regional reopening um, given the differences in your, your constituent bases? Yeah, I'd, I'd follow Chris and Nick 100% on that. I, I think um, you know, there's two very, very different, you know, there's, there's some, sometimes this area of the state, we really struggle to, to have our voices heard. And I think uh, uh, an editorial writer, Dwayne, uh, uh, Mr. Yancey in the Roanoke Times kind of summed it up pretty, pretty good. And, uh, you know, his, his comment was, let's say that there was some unique uh, terrible type of disease occurring in Southwest Virginia, but it did, had not an impacted to a significant degree Northern Virginia, would Northern Virginia be closed with Southwest Virginia? And I think we all know the answer to that. So I have come out publicly, as I think both Nick and Chris have, uh, in favor of looking at regional approaches. I think it makes sense. And I think there's parts of Virginia that you know, probably should follow, you know, North Carolina and parts that should follow Maryland and parts that should follow uh, perhaps West Virginia. And, and um, so there's, I agree with uh, the folks on the call. We see a number of, a number of our members on this call voicing the concern that the federal money through the CARES Act and the PPP is simply not sufficient to get businesses in Montgomery County through the, the crisis in the fall. And the question is raised, what state funding will be available and how will it be allocated? What can the three of you offer to our business community in terms of potential diversion of state funds in our direction if we see a fall without Virginia Tech football, if we see a fall without students at Radford and Virginia Tech, which will be a very significant blow to both our workforce and our customer base? Well, I, I would say that uh, expecting the state to be a huge supplier of, of funds to make up for revenue loss it would be like going to McDonald's and asking for filet mignon. I mean, we have $10, million, $10 billion in cash right now that is what the Commonwealth has to its name. Uh, when we decided to take um, savings from uh, the tax cut, the federal tax cut, uh, and allocate it uh, back to individual 
uh, taxpayers, you know, that was at $100 and $200 clip. And that was about $350 million um, to be able to do for, uh, for the entire Commonwealth. Uh, we uh, have been able to allocate directly to localities about $750 million, uh, but those are for direct COVID-related expenses, as, as Delegate Rush said. So think about it. If it's to give everybody 100 bucks or 200 bucks, depending on if you're a single or joint filer, and that was $350 million, we have about 10 billion. The reason why we're the number one state for business again is in large part because of the General Assembly's action to put more money into our revenue reserve fund that was newly created and put money into our rainy day fund, which had not really uh, been supplanted very well. You know, I would be open, you know, if there ever were to be a rainy day, not just looking outside, but thinking about what COVID is doing to our economy, this might be an opportunity to do it, but a revenue reserve fund as part of our 10 billion that we have on hand, is not really supposed to be touched um, in order to maintain our AAA bond rating that I would fight like hell to not lose con considering we've had it for decades. Um, maybe looking into the rainy day fund, but then that's about 3 billion. And so what are we gonna do? We're gonna decimate a fund that we just have been able to get us back into a position of not being in doubt with our credit rating agencies to now where we can make sure that we have you know, good options for bonding and for leverage in the future. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, all of that to say is, is I, I think if you're asking for the state to make up the difference between what you're not getting from the federal government and what you need, you're going to be disappointed. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo what Chris said. I, the, uh, the state's just not going to be in a position to, to print money, which the federal government is doing. Uh, I would say, well, I can, I'm very appreciative of the federal government and some of the programs they have. The longer they prolong uh, and keep adding programs, the slightly more difficult it's going to be to en enact a recovery. When I talk of that, I'm specifically talking about the unemployment, the expansion of the federal unemployment. In the Commonwealth of Virginia, if somebody is laid off from their job, uh, making less than $55,068, they're going to make more money on unemployment than coming back to work. Um, folks like Nick and, and in particular myself, people that are in the service industries, um, are most vast, vast majority of people in those industries do not make $55,000 a year. I uh, wish they did. Uh, but the problem is, uh, and I'm seeing it and hearing it over and over again, uh, the staff of the Roanoke restaurant, as an example, is having trouble getting their folks to come back where, where they're trying to expand their operations uh, because they're making quite a bit more uh, staying home than, than coming to work. And I think that if the federal government expands that, that unemployment beyond July 31st to September or December, the longer they push that out, the harder and the more devastating it's gonna be on, on businesses trying to recover. Yeah, I, I, I agree with both Chris and, and uh, Joe. Uh, where I think the state can be helpful is the relaxate, relaxation of some of the regulation that, uh, that, that I'm sure was good ideals at the time, but you look at the restaurant industry, whether it's ABC to go or, or allowing limited uh, mixed drinks to be sold to go, uh, you know, and there's, there, there's, I think there's examples, uh, you know, even in James's uh, industry where, where folks are no longer having to meet together so they can be more efficient. You can do some uh, virtual signing, um, some of those, those things like that. So if we can, you know, we can continue those, those things and then not add any more burdens on, on, on to uh, small, medium and large businesses and then open back up of some of the largest, uh, you know, uh, Joe and Chris and I um, see the largest employers in Southwest Virginia. Now, you know, we're, we're blessed. We have Virginia Tech, we have Radford University, we have wonderful manufacturer of Volvo, um, Radford Arsenal, all these, 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 these uh, federal mogul, all these places. And some of our counties, local school divisions are the largest employers. And uh, that's gonna be a way that we can, um, you know, making sure that our local school divisions are, uh, are funded properly and, and and don't take the brunt of a, of a ton of cuts, maybe doing some, doing some other things, uh, other places, um, so that those communities are having an infusion of, uh, um, of state dollars. But, uh, 
you know, as I said earlier, Joe and Chris uh, just emphasizes, emphasized, we, you know, the state of Virginia does not print money. Um, and uh, so we've got to uh, live within our budget. We, the AAA bond rating, um, I brag all the time about being elected in 1991 because I used to think it was cool because I was young. Now I'm old and it makes me seem old. But <laughs> Virginia's had a AAA bond rating since 1938. Um, that even predates John Edwards. So um, <laughs> I've used that joke every one of these things, but um, I just wish he was on here. But, uh, um, you know, that even predates John. So that saves us. Over the, over the lifetime of, of that AAA bond rating has saved Virginia billions and billions of dollars as, as we've uh, invested in infrastructure, we've invested in our, our universities uh, throughout the Commonwealth. And, and so it's, 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 it's something that we do have to uh, maintain. And along with uh, Chris and Joe, I'm, I'm going to work very hard to do that. I'm going to toss a question over to Henry Bass for a second, since you just raised the issue about investment in infrastructure. Um, under this new way of doing business, we, had, we definitely have an infrastructure need that has to be addressed specifically in Montgomery County and other rural areas of Southwest Virginia. Henry Bass has been very active both in the Chamber of Commerce and the Roanoke Blacksburg Technology Council and other organizations. He's the president and owner of automation creation software development firm that spans the New River and Roanoke Valleys. Henry, why don't you go ahead and throw your question out to the gentleman? Well, thanks so much, James. Uh, my question is, is prompted from some, um, some material I recently saw from um, uh, Steve Jones with the uh, Blacksburg uh, Town IT. And myself and others, not just in the computer business, are very concerned about broadband in our communities. As we're going forward, certainly this, this storm has highlighted the importance of good connectivity, high-speed network availability, not just for work, but for school, since Montgomery County schools are 100% distance learning right now. Uh, but we've got a lot of areas in our county that aren't well covered with broadband and don't even uh, fit the, the MIFI, the, the, the portable cellular networks. Steve Jones pointed out an article that, that ranked Virginia in the bottom three of all states for uh, regulatory access to, to make municipalities help fund a broadband initiative. That, that we just, we have too many restrictions in place for that. Can we do anything to improve broadband in Montgomery County and in the River Valley? Yeah, I, um, I'll take your question first. Um, I think that we do need to look at uh, abilities for more municipal broadband. All options certainly do need to be on the table, but you're talking about who are the stakeholders, right? So the telecoms don't want that. The telecoms are also the ones that are cost prohibitive on the middle mile and, and the last mile. Um, and so we have started, you know, the telecommunications initiative and, and we had allocated um, Nick, tell me, tell me if I'm wrong. And, and Joe knows a lot because he's been, really involved with the Roanoke uh, Valley Broadband. Um, it was something like 70 million that we had to unallot uh, because- I thought 50, but- it, 50? It's, I thought, yeah. but it was, it's more than we have at any other point. Yeah, well, I mean, we like seriously doubled down more than we did even in the last budget cycle for the previous biennium. And we had to unallot it because all of the new monies that we wanted to allot towards new investments and programs uh, we simply could not guarantee that the money would be there. As Delegate Rush said, uh, we are still up uh, a few percentage points from where we were year to year for revenues in the Commonwealth. Uh, but whether that lasts through the rest of the fiscal year and whether that maintains into 2020 um, uh, fiscal year is going to be uh, a challenge. I think at this point, I'm going to knock on wood and say that we aren't going to have to make additional cuts like we had to do in the Great Recession, uh, but that new allotment of funding might not be there for the biennium, and that's going to stall us because essentially it's subsidizing the work that the telecoms uh, don't feel is in their financial interest to do right now. Um, but I, in terms of being able to have other options, um, I have had evolving conversations with Montgomery County folks about what they're trying to do. Uh, to, to have broadband uh, in, in the county. It's obviously a huge need. I represent Giles and Pulaski as well, uh, and the city of Bradford, where we have intermittent problems with broadband all over. 
Uh, but the Batty program has been working uh, to get millions of dollars for that last mile connectivity. Uh, but we really needed that extra tens of millions of dollars to be able to do that, that exhaustive work and be able to complete a lot of it. And we simply won't be able to guarantee those funds will be able to be allocated now. Yeah, yeah I would to echo a little, you know, I just checked. I think Chris was right. It was 70 million. So that's my bad, Chris. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's been a priority of the General Assembly um, and, 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 and through multiple governors. Uh, the, the, the problem is very, very complex. And I think Chris, uh, Chris brought up the stakeholders. So you really have to have local governments, state governments. There's some federal funding that's available, but you also have to have the private sector. And, and Henry, uh, I, I know, Colonel, you, 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 you're involved in all the, um, uh, the Blacksburg uh, Technology Council. We've got to have stakeholders like that, uh, not, just, not just banging on us uh, every now and then with uh, with good questions, but also advocating for it at, at the Board of Supervisors meetings um, and asking your vendors, what, what, are, what is Verizon doing in, in, with 5G and, and some of the things that, we're, that, that, that we, we hope we can, we can grow uh, technology-wise. Uh, I'm, you know, and if broadband uh, is, is, is problematic, especially if you got to work from home. Um, you know, I, I live here in the town of Christiansburg and um, we upped our, our speed. I don't know what that means. My wife, my wife is a computer program, so she, so she's working from home. So she upped the speed of our, our, uh, of our service. We're both Zooming right now. I think she's downstairs on her own meeting. Uh, so I guess it's working fine. But if, you know, if I lived in, um, in Giles County or in uh, rural Eastmont or uh, over in uh, uh, Pulaski County, uh, you know, we could have some problems. Um, you know, the real leader in this, um, and uh, Colonel, I know you probably know this, is uh, Floyd County with uh, Citizens uh, uh, Co-op. And that was a partnership with the state, uh, which just, uh, they just got some state funds, uh, federal monies from, uh, from the early 2000s. Uh, their own funds, and then, you know, uh, able to put that through. So so we actually have broadband access. I think uh, uh, my man John Tuttle and I sat down in my office one time and, and looked at all the uh, actual broadband we have in Montgomery County. The crazy thing is we don't have access to it. Um, you know, we've got a uh, fiber optic line. I'm probably messing up the term, so... Um, y'all, y'all, y'all correct me when I get off or shoot me an email, tell me I'm dumb, but you know, I know we've got the line running down route eight. Um, we have it to all of our schools in Montgomery County. So it is down to Eastmont. Um, we also have, uh, in, in the same in, in, uh, in, in Pulaski County. And I think, uh, uh the, the Floyd, uh, citizens goes all the way to Giles County. So we've connected our schools, which means we do have broadband throughout the region. We just now have to figure out, um, and you know, look, the state putting some money into it is not going to figure it out. It's going to have to be private sector, local governments on the ground uh, with Chris, myself, and Joe helping. Um, but uh, getting that access out to the citizens, and uh, as well as be last uh, mile connectivity or, or broader access. And of course, we live in the mountains which means line of sight, uh, which is an old technology I used when I was in 82nd Airborne Division to do, to communicate, which is very, very, uh, line of sight technology is very tough uh, to do in the mountains. So um, it's it's something you guys need to keep hitting us up on. Uh, sorry, somebody's calling me. Um, keep hitting us on. We're gonna, we're gonna maintain our vigilance um, and also let us know where we can help because we've got to bring the stakeholders and everybody's got to be involved. This is not a government only solution. Yeah, I, I think it was well said. I just want to add just a couple quick things. If, if you think about a $70 million over two years in broadband, that's a pretty significant in, uh, investment. That was in a very, very good budget year. Um, as Chris mentioned, that's gone and who knows when we'll have another, what, a, what might be referred to as a good budget year or a year of expansion in revenue. So, I th and even at 70 million, it's a couple million dollars, it's a million dollar grant here, it's 800,000 here. The Virginia Telecommunication Initiative uh, awarded a little bit of money to, to Craig County last year, your, I think it was last year. Uh, so there are gonna be those little bits of, of, federal, of uh, state money and hopefully some, some federal money too, but 
really it's going to be, as Nick has mentioned, people working together. So in Roanoke County with the Roanoke County Broadband Initiative, well, our stake was about $3 million. When you think about what it did to, from a business perspective and lower and changing the, really the dynamics, not only from, uh, Roanoke County doesn't have nearly the issue with availability as they do with costs. So uh, it really changed the, the ground rules. And then that increases the, really the value of the underlying property and, and the value of our county, uh, whether it's Montgomery County, Craig County, City of Salem. So I think you're going to continue to see some, you're, you're going to have some initiatives, um, but it's going to really require, I think it's going to be a lot more locally driven. Uh, I would say though, when Montgomery County has needs, I do need to just, many of you are probably aware of it, but to do a quick shout out to, to, to Chris and Delegate Hurst and Delegate Rush, Montgomery County for a, county of 100,000 people has two people on the house appropriation staff that decides where money goes, um, you know, very, very powerful positions. You have a senator, Senator Edwards, that sits on the Senate Finance, which is the equivalent body, uh, not exactly the equivalent body, but from Montgomery County's perspective, I think Montgomery County always has very, very good rec representation, at least right now, on the money committees and determining where things go. So you can all feel very good and proud of those representatives. Thank you for those responses. We've had several members follow up and simply encourage a more proactive stance on elevating the needs of broadband infrastructure to the same platform as I-81 expansion and rail expansion, given where we're going in the future, both with telemedicine uh, one member has expressed a concern that a number of elderly and seniors in our area are not getting the routine care that they need because they're too afraid to go visit their doctor and go approach the healthcare facilities while the COVID-19 situation is at hand. And so without adequate internet service where they live in the rural areas, there's a concern that a number of our seniors are going to see declining health and other health-related issues into the fall by not seeking treatment of routine problems. It could That's be because Allen's got those big signs up in front of the hospital. <laughs> so if, if, if we can get the broadband elevated just from a, a state platform and, and for those who are in charge of money, um, that's certainly something that many of our members are expressing a sincere interest in. In our waning couple of minutes here, I'd like to just toss it to each of the three of you uh, for a, a brief comment on what do you see as the most important business related endeavors that are going to come up both in a potentially special session in August and then when you resume back um, to your next regularly scheduled session. Uh, Delegate McNamara, anything that you see that is on your plate right now that you're aware of that's a very specific business owner, business um, centric issue that you're dealing with? Well, I think it, uh, we need to be more proactive than we have been. We're going to have to do things, uh, we're gonna to have to do significant changes to the budget. We had 75 days left in the current budget that Chris Hurst referred to uh, that we could have started to make some changes. I'm concerned uh, that we did not cancel any of our new spending within the, the state government, uh, but rather delayed hoping out uh, to, on a hope and a prayer that we're gonna be funded by the, the, uh, the federal government. The biggest concern I have, uh, I've related to many of the local uh, uh, local areas, local governments as well. I think we need to um, we we need to make adjustments, unfortunately, and we need to make sure we line up ongoing revenues with ongoing expenses. Uh, I'm going to be very concerned personally of using one-time revenues uh, to fund and continue ongoing programs. So. Um, that, um, you know, to some degree that can happen a little bit, given the, 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 the volume of the crisis that we're in. But I think from a long-term perspective, we need to align our revenues with our expenses. And um, uh, I, I think we can do it. I think we're up to the challenge. There's not been a, a revenue decline in the Commonwealth of Virginia for a number of years. So there's probably some areas that it might make some sense for us to look at a, a little bit carefully. And that's probably the same in, in many of our local governments as well. Thank you. Delegate Hurst or Delegate Rush? 
Nick, do you want to go? No, I mean, I, uh, you know, I think as we move forward, we're going to, um, you know, the budget will be the number one thing that we deal with in, uh, in August or September. And as I, you know, I think I, I alluded to or, or mentioned earlier, we just don't have the data on what that's going to look like yet. We're still in, in, in a positive territory. Joe and Chris and I know that that's not going to be the case uh, moving forward into the next fiscal year. So we, we've got to monitor that. We've got to, and then we got to prioritize spending. And it, it's going to start with uh, K through 12 and higher education and public safety. Um, and so with, with, with those priorities um, and, and an ability to open back up our economy regionally, we hope that uh, we'll be able to uh, work this through. But there's going to be some other things that we can uh, codify, um, whether it be um, how we do some of our, our business transactions uh, um, by uh, mediums uh, like this, or, or, or some of the other things that we've done. Uh, there's some uh, you know, with restaurants. And and, uh, and other folks. Uh, so moving forward, we we have to work together as a team. You know, Joe and I and uh, differ with Chris on some things, but uh, it's never been where if we've got an issue, the three of us um, uh, that we that is specific to Montgomery County, New River Valley, and even even uh, if Joe needs Chris and I's help in uh, the Roanoke Valley, there's never been something that. Uh, we don't look at it as, as how we can work together. And we're going to, you know, I would suspect that regionally we'll go to, uh, to the June assembly session, whether it be in September and, um, make sure that, uh, that we are well represented. Yeah. I would just kind of go back to what, uh, we had at the beginning of this call with Christy. It's about early childhood education. It's about education overall. Uh, thankfully, we did not have to, um, uh, I, I would hope rather that we will not be in a position where we have to make drastic cuts to our K-12 uh, and pre-K system like we had to do at the beginning of the, the Great Recession, where we have just now, 10 years later, been able to restore that funding to where we are. Uh, we have to continue to um, market ourselves as a place where you can raise your family, uh, where they're going to have a high quality education, no matter where uh, their zip code is uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so I would take, uh, in my mind, every single available dollar that we have and invest it into early childhood education, because uh, that is a huge way of, of incenting new business uh, and having our existing businesses continue to thrive if we can provide those child care solutions and then make sure that when they get into the uh, public education system, that they have a high quality education there uh, that prepares them for being able to go to a, a great institution like Radford uh, or Virginia Tech or, or NRCC. So uh, I continue to think that our investments have to look at education, early childhood education, and making sure that our higher education is sustainable. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today on behalf of the Chamber and all of the members who are here on this call. It's super important that, that we have the opportunity to engage you and that you have the opportunity to hear from the members and respond directly like this. So thank you so much for taking your time out. We've got a number of business leaders, I see town council members, board of supervisors members, other business leaders who have participated today. So it obviously was very important for them all and we appreciate them taking their time out of their day as well. And with that, I think we're right out of time. I'm going to toss it back to Josie at the Chamber to close us out. Thank you, James. Thank you for moderating our session. Thank you, gentlemen, um, our delegates, for your time and for making us a priority and representing us well um, at the state level. We very much appreciate you and your commitment to your constituents. Um, thank you again to Alan Fabian and Lewis Gale Hospital Montgomery for sponsoring today. I hope you all have a safe week, a happy week, and we'll see you very soon. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.